coding examples, so it might be easier to see. Is that good? Um, my name is Dave Terry. I work for a company called Pacific Data Management and uh, been designing database systems for 25 years. And I've been working with Wakanda for a couple of years. I'm fascinated with the product. And uh, I've written some documentation, done some webinars and stuff. And today the topic is how do you handle Wakanda security in a practical sense? That's my, you know, I almost titled this uh, session, just how to stop bad things from happening. So by security, I mean a very, very broad topic of how do you keep uh, your data from being modified out from underneath you, access when it shouldn't be, and so on. And you've seen a lot of these techniques throughout the day if you were in different sessions. I'm just going to bring them all together and show them to you in succession so you know what your tools are. Okay. First off, you should really know your tools, your security tools in Wakanda. There's a variety of different kinds. If you leave one of them out, it makes it pretty difficult to control what people can do in your application. So uh, be aware of all these things. Scope, users, groups, authentication, and permissions, restricting queries. Boy, you've heard a lot about them. They are, they are really, really important in Wakanda. Class methods, the fact that you can wrap things together and then control who can run class methods. Session storage, which is an object on the back end that allows you to store information about uh, whatever you want to put there, but very often I use it for authentication information. Uh, inheritance. Inheritance is really important. There's a lot of things it play, a lot of roles it plays in security. Calculated attributes can play a role in security. Data class events, which is the, st the standard main way to control validation. Transactions. Don't forget about transactions. Just like any other database, you want to bundle things together and not let them be piecemeal. And then HTTPS, if you want to encrypt your communications layer, that's going to be important also. So go through all these and remember they're all there. And there's probably more than I'm forgetting, but these are the really big ones that you want to pay attention to. So first, let me just give you some basic concepts in security. Um, the first line of defense I'm going to say is design your model so that all the things that you never want to leave the server don't leave the server. Uh, regardless of who the user is. So, you know, you may have some data, some functions, all kinds of back-end processing that you do not want to be exposed to the browser. Uh, make sure they aren't. I'll show you how to do that. Uh, you want to place as much business logic as you can get away with into the code that is only accessible on the server. Okay? Once again, protect yourself. Make sure that the request coming from the browser can't mon monkey with your application. Uh, you're going to use authentication and permissions and the whole mechanism to do with that to make sure that the person who is trying to do something in your application is authorized to do that thing in your application. Um, you're going to find the need to, to wrap grouped modifications together into class methods so that you can write all this stuff at one time. If you were at the the uh, previous session, Laurent showed you how you would pull data, put it in arrays, and work with it in arrays. Well, then you're going to reverse that process at some point and pa possibly pass it back to the server. Okay? And you want, a, you want a routine that will handle that. Uh, you're going to use restricting queries extensively to control who can see what entities. And here's one thing that Wakanda, uh, uh, a security issue with Wakanda that you have to pay attention to. Um, 
what kind of makes it super easy to modify data, very easy to modify data from the browser side. So don't assume that data that you've sent off to the browser in a read-only way isn't being modified when it comes back. And I'm going to make a point of that and show you how to handle that. Um, construct your client-side code so that it supports and mirrors the business logic on the back end. But don't count on your client-side code. Okay? You, things can get spoofed. Don't ever count on the browser doing your validation. And then, of course, reference your pages when you really need to if, it's, if you're worried about the communication layer through HTTPS so that we don't have to worry about what it is that's going back and forth, okay? Um, that's the wrong slide. So let me first start with this. Okay, so this is just a solution I created for, for this session to illustrate the various things that have to do with security. And your very first line of defense is an item called scope. Scope lets you lop off sections of your application so that they are not in any way available to the browser. So here's an example here. Let's say I've got this data class, and this data class is contracts. And, you know, it's not much in it, but it does have this amount down here. And if we go and look at this data class here, I'm just going to look at them and see what's in there. Here they are, there's only three entities, but you can see that this thing down here, the summary of it is commission sharing with American business and it, the amount over here is $1.2 million. That kind of sounds like something you don't want to be going out to the browser possibly. So how would we control that? Never, ever, ever let it off the browser. So first thing we do is, let's say we don't want a mount to go off, all you do is set that particular property to be public, you, can, you have a variety of different options, but at least public on server save the model, reload the model, and now if we try to access that through a browser, you see that I'm not getting that information. It's as if that attribute doesn't even exist from the browser's point of view. This is what the Wakanda grid does if you try to just bind it to an attribute that doesn't even exist. It just gives you wrong reference, you're an idiot, what are you doing, kind of thing. So. Now that's if you want to get rid of a particular attribute or attributes. Um, what if you didn't want this entire data class to be available? Well, let's ch check, set this back. We're going to set the entire data class now to public on server. Save it. I'm public on server. So now it's, it's still completely available on the server, and I'll show you that. But it's not going to be available to the browser. It's public up to the server. That's it. So. All I do is reload the models, go look at this same web, web page. You can see that even the editor's barking at me. And there's our page. What do Wakanda widgets do if you try to attach them to something that doesn't exist at all? It just pretty much they say, I'm not going to even try to draw anything. Okay? Now, this does not affect access on the server. Here it is. I still can get to it from server side code. Okay, so that's your very first line of defense. Very easy to use. Um, but the thing with scope is scope does not respect who you are at all. If you're an admin user, doesn't care. It's still not going to show it to you. So scope is unsituational. It is guaranteed for sure something you don't want to get off the server. You can set scope even on methods. You can set them on attributes. You can set them on the entire data class and try to turn that off. So your next line of defense is the whole concept of users, groups, authentication, and permissions. And it's kind of a, a bundle of, of, of abilities. And I'm going to go through that really quickly. Um, when you create a new Wakanda solution, you get an item called the directory. That's this item right here. And the directory's job is to store users and groups for all of your projects that are in that solution. So when you first open it up, you don't have any users. And creating users is pretty simple. Oh, it's not that hard. Here, I'm going to create one. I'm going to create an admin user. OK. 
Come on. Do it. Let's put in Dave. That'll be me. And we'll put in another one, and that'll be Dan. That's it. I just created a whole bunch of users, not a whole bunch, three users. And uh, that's how easy it is to just put them in the directory. You didn't see me do any code. I just typed them in. That's it. Now, that's only a small piece to the puzzle, though. I have, excuse me, sorry. I have uh, definitely got users now. And to tell the truth, if I wanted to, I could log into the system just having those users. But I haven't really said what they can do. I haven't really tried to control them in any way. So that's where groups come in. Now, there are three uses to groups. First off, let me show you where they are. They're just another tab in the directory. And when you first log in, I mean, when you first create a new solution, there will be already two groups in there for you, admin and debugger. The admin group is a special group. If you put a user in that group that has a password, it, in essence, turns on the password system for Wakanda Studio. And what kind of studio now has to also put in a password to log in. It's how you're going to lock down your, your, your um, servers, even from Wakanda projects. So, and debugger is access to the debugger. You generally want to have somebody in each of these groups, and I'm going to show you that in a second. First, let's just talk about groups. What are groups for? Groups have two purposes, I mean three purposes. Groups hold users. Groups bundle users together in a way that there might be some commonality to their permissions. So groups hold users. They, they, they're just a way of saying a whole bunch of users together. Groups also provide a way to hierarchically control permissions. Groups provide a form of hierarchy because a group can hold another group. When you do that, the contained group takes on the privileges of the containing group. The inside group takes on the privileges of the outside group, okay? And then the final thing is groups are the things that you're going to attach to various control points inside your Wakanda data model, okay? So those are the three things that groups provide you with. Let's see, let's create some groups. Um, I always create a group called internal or you can call it system, and its job is to have nobody in it. And you're gonna use that to turn off permissions that you want nobody to access. I'm gonna create one called manager, and I'm gonna create one called employee, okay? And in employee, I'm gonna put Dan. In manager, I'm gonna put me. In uh, admin, I'm going to put the admin user. You're not seeing me doing any code here. And then I'm going to nest the groups, right? Manager is going to include, let's see, employee is going to include manager. Got to do it the right way. Manager is going to include admin. And admin is going to include internal. Now, remember I said that groups take on permissions of the outer group. It can get kind of confusing. The way I just did this is I said uh, the employee group contains the manager group. So the manager group actually is higher level. But just to make sure, let me give you a diagram to help this really hammer this home. This is how I nested them. I put the internal in an admin, admin in manager, manager in an employee. And if you have this diagram, it becomes quite clear that if I now put somebody in the manager group, they are also within the employee group, okay? So I'm just trying to make it really clear how you nest groups together. Now, ooh, I had an extra group. So I put all these things in, and now I go back to my model, and I'm saying, I wanna, I wanna do something now. I've got users, I've got groups, I've put some people in groups, how do I start buttoning down access? Well, here's the, a, a data class called employee. And let's say I don't want uh, anybody but manager level people to be able to get to employees. 
Well, right now, if I go and run this project, run this page, I'm not even logged in and I can get to employees. That's not good. It's got salary and access level. That's not good. So what do I do? I go back to the model and I say, on the employee, I'm going to set some groups at the permission control points. Now, you see these down here. You can set these at the overall model level. You can set them at the data class level. And for the methods, you can set them at the method level. Okay, so you have various levels to do it. Uh, they're pretty simple. Read means you can access entities from this data class. Create, you can save a new entity. Update, you can save an existing entity after modifying it. And remove means you can delete the in, you can delete entities in this data class. For methods, there's execute. What level, what group do you have to be in before you can execute it? And promote. Promote is not a control point. Promote is a companion piece of information that says when I do run this method, I want the privileges to be bumped up to whatever level group I put in this area down here. So that a low level user running a, a method, the method can gain bigger privileges than the user would have gotten normally, okay? But I'm gonna just stick to the, to the, to the data class permissions here. I'm gonna say, okay, well, oh, let me save my directory. That would be smart, okay? Stop that. When you make uh, directory level changes, you have to restart the server. So I'm gonna go here, I'm gonna say, uh, I want the, to, to read this, I wanna be at least a manager. To update, I wanna be in the internal group, meaning nobody, and remove nobody. Okay, and now when I start this, first off, I put somebody in the admin group so Wakanda Studio has to even log in now. And if I go to this web page, can't get to entities anymore. If I log in as Dave, I can get to him. If I log out and log in as Dan, it's still an official login, but can't get to him. Okay, very easy, very simple. And that will work for a lot of applications. That's about what you want in many cases. You know, you got maybe 10 users, maybe you share usernames or whatever. Um, and I haven't done any code yet. So that's one way to do it. That's the simplest way. The next way that you, you may consider doing is what's called a login listener. Okay. Make sure I'm on tar target here. A login listener is a method that you write that sits between the, the user trying to authenticate from the browser and the directory. It's the, it's a, it's a, it plays the role of deciding whether or not the person gets to log in. And let me give you an example of a login listener here. Here is one I wrote. It's just called my login up here. It's very simple. The pattern you see to login listeners throughout the day, they're gonna be very similar. And, and this is a method you write, and uh, it, takes, it, it's, it receives two parameters, the username and the password, and then it's your job to decide what to do next. And you do that by returning one of three things. If you return the value false, then you are in essence punting and saying, I don't want to try to figure out if you're supposed to get into the system. I'm passing control back to the directory, and then it acts just like it was going back to the directory. It's like the login listener didn't exist. The other possibility you can return, one other possibility, is an error object. It's a typical Wakanda type error object, it's just a JavaScript object. And if you return anything where the error property, which is supposed to be numeric, is not zero, then in essence you're telling it, no, you can't log in and you're gonna throw the error message or whatever that is. Now, the third thing you can possibly return is this object right here. And this is very, very important, okay? This object is just a JavaScript object, you're constructing it, but it needs certain properties. And those properties are ID, which will be a UUID or will be converted into a UUID, name, 
which is generally the login name, full name, which is the official how you want it to look name, and then two more properties, belongs to, which is an array of groups, and storage, which is an object to put something into session storage. Session storage is an object that's maintained for each context that is created as a result of the authentication. So each user gets a session storage for the life of their session, and so that, that way you can at this point decide who they are, put whatever you need into session storage, and then from then on, all downstream logic in your application can count on this being in session storage. And that's how you decide what you want to do about everything. Okay? Now, all this does is it uses, it looks up an employee, it uses a, a function to check to see what they typed in. Does it match the hash value that we have stored? You know, it just does some general work. It sticks them in a particular group based on their employee access level. All this stuff is coming out of my data instead of out of the, 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 the directory. Now, um, if you, if it's at this point, yes. If you do it this way, yes. There are other ways to log in though. You could do that also. I, I, I just wanted to make it clear, you know. True. If you're in, and your point is, yeah, if anybody gets to your server, that's your right. But then again, if anybody gets to your server, there's a lot of other things they could be doing, right? I mean. There's this, at this particular point, it's not really in the open. Uh, it has already been, uh, if you threw it through HTTPS, you can also do a, a login by hash. It's, I'm just doing this to make it clear to everybody. So, okay, so let's go on. Um, now, this is a method that I wrote. The next thing to try to figure out is, how does this get installed as the login listener? Um, well, that's pretty easy. I create a, a, a JavaScript file that's just called startup. And in it, you use this particular call on the directory. The directory is a global object maintained by Wakanda server. And it's set login listener, my login. And the reason why this works is because I put this function, my login, in the require.js file, which is a file of all the objects that will be maintained by Wakanda server globally. So I say startup. The second parameter is under whose authority will this login listener run? So now it's an internal group. It's a top level group. It can do anything it needs to inside the login listener. Okay. Now the last thing to know is what caused this to run? Well, this runs simply by setting this to a bootstrap file. Okay. And now when I log in, let's see. Oh, I guess I already had it set, so it should still work now. If I run this page, log out, and I'm going to log in now as somebody not from the directory. I typed in Dave, capital D, and a capital T. That's not a person in the directory. That was just Dave. And now I can authenticate based on something out of my data classes. Okay? If I log out and I log in as, oh, I don't know. Let's do Dan W., another person in the data class. They logged in, but they can't get to anything. So you can determine the user, the whole session, on the fly, in essence, in the login listener. And that's how I do all of them, because I like having control over that login. And very often, though, you're going to need to attach the user to your entities to say who they are, and maybe even attach it to a, an entity in your data class, in, in one of your data classes. So, okay, let's keep going here. Now. Let's remove those permissions. I want to make sure I don't make a mistake here. OK. 
Okay, now, the third major capability to control access to entities is what's called a restricting query. Scope lops things off. Uh, authentication lets you control who can see what based on the permissions. But if you have the permission to read entities in a data class, you have the permission to read all entities in the data class. Now we need to start slicing it at the data level, okay? So here's an example. Here's a data class called review. It's got in here your review score, your previous salary, the increased percent, your new salary, right? This is the kind of thing we definitely don't want other employees to be able to see, right? If I log in, I should only be able to see my own reviews, unless I guess if I log in and I'm an admin user, maybe I should be able to see everybody's reviews. So here it's situational which entities I should be able to get to. And I don't want to count on the browser's queries to be the things that restrict this. I want to make it hard and fast, absolutely, they can't get around it, okay? And that's where a restricting query comes in. So restricting query, I use the unrestricting query event. There's another way to do a restricting query, but this one is the one I prefer. And in it, your, your job in a restricting query is to return an entity collection. That's your job. And the way I always start my, my restricting queries is I always say, the very first thing I'm going to do is create a result that is an empty entity collection, and I'm going to return that if everything else fails. And the result is, even if they do have permission somehow to get to this data class, if my code doesn't let them see anything, they will see nothing. They'll still have a valid data class, they just won't have any entities in it, okay? So what do I do here? Well, I get this, this thing called the current session, which is uh, maintained by Wakanda Server. It's the, it's the global object for this particular authentications session. I get that, and I check to see if it belongs to the admin group. If it does, then I'm saying pretty much, well, they can get to all the reviews. Now, if they're not an admin user, then what I do is I look into session storage. Remember, I put that there in my login listener for my ID, a property I defined. I get that ID, and provided it's there, I look up the reviews where I am the person the review is about. That's all I'm doing here. And the result is something like this. I did save that, didn't I? Oh, I didn't. Darn it. Okay, so now if I log in as Dave T, and I say, show me the reviews. I'm just saying show me all the reviews. There is no way to get to somebody else's reviews with that restricting query in place. And here it is, you can see these are for me. If I log out, log in for, as say, John B. When I look at reviews, I see his reviews. And that's just show all. If I log out and log in as an admin user, Remember, this is one in the directory. Our login listener won't find this in the data class, so it punts back to the directory. But that directory does have the admin user in the admin group, so now I can see all of them. Okay, so that's your first line of defense, controlling who can get access to entities. And I'm going to give you a little quick diagram here. This is how it looks. This circle up here is all the data classes where the user has read access. This circle over here is the data classes that are public access, N nothing to do with the user. And this down here are the data classes, are actually the entities that are being returned from data classes based on their restricting queries. It is this intersection in the middle that makes it to the browser. It also makes it to the server. You can also get to those entities on the server, but it needs to be in this middle in order to make it to, to, to the browser. You can still get to them on the server if they at least have read access and they were returned by restricting queries. 
Scope doesn't matter. Scope, if it's just public on server, it would be still available on the server. Okay? Now, let's close some of these things. Now that's access, accessing entities. There's another thing to security, which is controlling modifications, right? They meet all that criteria, they can get to the entities, it's legitimate, and now they're starting to edit entities. And we want to control what they can do to those entities, and there's a lot of tools. Um, I'm going to give you a really quick and dirty one first. Here's an employee data class, and um, let's say I don't want people to be able to change salary. Salary is not something I want people to be able to log into, but let's say I am allowing that as an attribute that's going off to the browser. Well, I don't want them to be able to change it, but Maconda makes it so easy to change data that maybe it comes back changed. So instead what I'm going to do is I'm not going to let it go off to the, to the browser. I'll set it to public on server and I'll replace it with a, a calculated attribute, right? Here it is, I called it salary calc. So well, salary calc gives you some way to put code between getting and setting the value. Getting is easy, right? That's just return the salary, okay? But the setting, I can actually check and make sure, for instance, that they are part of the admin group before I'm gonna accept the value and stick it back into salary. Quick and dirty way to do it. I don't recommend that you do this with a whole bunch of attributes. If you did, I mean, you'd have to mirror a bunch of attributes and it'd just be kind of a crazy thing. But you know, in some cases, this might be the appropriate way to do it really quick and easy, okay? Now, the official way and the most powerful way to control entity modifications is um, entity events, a a data class events, particularly on validate. Let me show you that real quickly here. Let's start with this data class. Okay, now, there is an event that you get that runs when the entity comes back from the browser and it's going to be saved or deleted or what have you. You get different events for different things. So you have an opportunity here to run some code and to reject the, 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 the thing that caused the event to happen in the first place. I'm gonna focus on the on validate event. There are two events that run when you go to save an entity. There is on validate and on save. They fire on validate first, then on save. And there is a way to run just the on validate by itself. The on validate is intended to be the place where you put your verification of the entity, just the rules by which this entity has to live, okay? That's what that's meant for. The on save is meant for the busy work that goes with saving data. If you're updating other entities or you know, writing external resources or whatever you want to do that go with uh, saving. So you separate those so that you can run your on validate independently and then just check to verify that the entity is going to be able to be saved when it is saved. Okay, that's its purpose. So let's look at the code in here. And it's not really that fancy. On validate, the, your goal is to return an object that is an error object, the Wakana error object, if you don't like what you see. And you see, I always start with a blank error. This is the same thing as no error up here at the top, and I return it. So if, in that case, something down here has to generate an error for me to make this stop. Um, what do I do? It's very simple. I'm saying the, the invoice date, if it's null, then I'm gonna return no invoice state, and that's an error. Now, if it isn't null, then I'm gonna start checking something. And let's say our business rules say that no one can post date one of these records, one of these entities. No one can put a date inside this uh, sales order, what was or this invoice, uh, that is older than today. That's our rule, except for the admin user. An admin user can do that, because we're gonna let admins do all kinds of things. So here's the, here's the code down here. I'm doing current session, does it belong to admin? 
Well, actually, does it not belong to admin? If it's an admin, then it's not going to throw an error. And then what do I do? I'm just doing some rigmarole down here to make sure that the invoice date, if it's less than today, it gives, throws an, an error. That's what I'm trying to do. Let's show that working. It's just very simple. Okay, I'm going to log out because I was in as administrator. Log in as um, Dave T. Okay. And I already got one of these up here in the, in the screen, so I'm just going to change the date to... Oh, no, that's not good. I'm going to change the date to 10 2. That's in the past, and I'm Dave T. You cannot post date invoices. Okay? If I change this and make it into the future, invoice saved. So that's how, that's the proper normal way to do validation is in your on validate. Okay? Now, um, that's just generic validation. You're probably used to that, you know, making sure that everything in the entity looks proper. That's all you're doing at that point. But there is another need in Wakanda. Wakanda makes it so easy to modify entities. You notice that in this code, I didn't check any of the other attributes, right? So there's a new need where you have to be assured that, that they didn't modify an attribute that you didn't want to be modified, even if it did meet validation. You might not want it to be changed. So let me give you an example of that. Here's a, another data class called transaction. In the sense of like a financial transaction. So it's got a transaction date, a transaction type, and an amount. And our rules say, once you write one of these babies down, you cannot change any of those attributes. We will let you change the comments about the transaction. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll let you do that. But you cannot change the date, the type, or the amount. How would we handle that type of situation? Well, here is, I'm going to give you an example of that. Um, I'm going to use an on validate. And if you look down here, it's very similar to the previous one. The one difference is it's got this function called get modified attributes. Get modified attributes is a new uh, thing in Wakanda of three that tells you, gives you an array of the attribute names of all the attributes that have been modified. Well, then that's pretty easy after that. All I do is I cycle through them. This is the, just going through an array. And I'm just saying, are, is it the ID, is the transaction date, is the amount? And any of those things, if you change them, I'm going to throw an error. Okay. Um, I can give you an example of that if you want. So, regardless of even if you're logged in or not, if I come down here and try to change the, oh, I don't know, debit to credit, invalid change. So, that gives you an idea of how you would handle, whoops, go back here, modifications that you don't want to have happen. I don't even want to look into transaction date to find out if the date meet, meets my requirements. I don't want it to have been changed no matter what. That's a little bit different. Now, you know some drawbacks about this code right here. First off, I'm doing this only if it's not new, so only a modified attribute, a modified uh, transaction. Um, I'm, I'm hard coding the list of the attributes in here. Uh, there's no exceptions for the user, right? Everybody has to pass these rules. There's all kinds of things. It's not very easy to reuse this for another data class. So let me give you an example of what I'm trying to get to. Here it is. Here's just another data class. And here's my goal. I want it to be that when I run on validate, I call a function called Get me all the list of invalid modifications, passing in the entity I'm in. I want this generic me uh, method to be able to handle that. Give me the list of mods, and if there's any at all, pass them off and tell it to the, to the client. Okay? So let's look at get invalid mods. That's over here in our require.js file. And it's down here. And it's not really, it's, it's, you know, it looks like it's got a lot of lines, but it doesn't really do that much. Really all it does is it takes an entity, 
It figures out what the data class name of that entity is, because I want it to work for all data classes. It gets a particular object out of session storage, which I'm going to show you being put there in a different uh, login listener. And then it looks to see if there is um, an array of invalid create attributes or invalid update attributes, two different arrays. And then if I then examine whether or not any of those have been modified and I return a string that says what the errors are, what, what got modified that shouldn't have been modified. Nothing in here is specific to a particular data class. And if you look up here, here's, a, here's the, the login listener I gotta use in order to make this work. I'm gonna stop this so I can tr put in a new login listener. And here's all I'm doing. I'm creating a project object inside my login listener and I'm adding some properties to it that are arrays, and some of those arrays have different values based on which group you're in. If you're a manager, you can't change priority or visible. If you're an admin user, you just can't change the ID. If you're uh, uh, an employee, you can't change the ID, the name, the priority, or visible, right? So now we're getting individual rules for each user. Well. Now all we need to do is install this as the login listener. Whoops, wrong one, which I have over here. Start the project up. And now if I go to another web page, just for projects, If you remember, okay, so I'm gonna log in now as uh, Dave T. I'm a manager. If I come down here and I change all these things, and I try to save, I get the error, and since the way I, des I put the error together is it told me that I can't change priority or visible, if I log out, and log in as somebody else, somebody lower level, let's say, and I change everything. That one can't change the name, the budget, or the priority, or the visible. Okay, I guess I'm done. I've just been, the, the hook's been given to me. So that just gives you an idea. This. This, uh, there will be a document, and I'm gonna put the solution with it. It'll be up on the wakanda.org website so that you can get a hold of this, and it'll just show you these techniques. Very, very easy to do, very clean, keeps you safe. So, thank you very much.